In this lecture, we will cover the remainder of the endocrine system. We will cover the thyroid through the thymus. The thyroid gland secretes two hormones, but it also produces thyroid hormone and calcitonin. The thyroid gland, which sits in the anterior portion of the neck region, is composed of follicular cells, parafollicular cells, and colloid. The follicular cells, which you can see in this image, secrete thyroid hormone. Within the follicular cells, they create these different sections, you could say. <clears throat> the follicular cells kind of encapsulate the colloid, okay, which is more of a jelly-like substance it's full of proteins. It also contains the precursor for thyroid hormone, and it contains iodine as well. And in addition to these little regions of follicular cells and colloid, you have additional structures here. These are your parafollicular cells. They secrete calcitonin. Thyroid hormone is your main metabolic hormone. It regulates your basal metabolic rate, your BMR, and it assists with thermoregulation. Thyroid hormone comes in two forms. You have thyroxine, which is T4. This comes from the follicular cells. Okay, the T4 is sent out to your body. Once your body cells receive the T4, it converts it to triiodothyronine, T3. Okay. The T3 is more potent than the T4. T3, <clears throat> T4, what are we talking about? We're talking about the number of iodine atoms present. T3 has three iodines, while T4 has four iodines. It's kind of easy to remember. Um, the iodine itself, remember, is stored in the colloid. And if we flip back to our picture, okay, the follicular cells okay, are the ones secreting the T4. Okay, and the colloid is where you're going to store all that iodine. So right next door makes it convenient. Okay. We have previously mentioned that the hypothalamus would secrete TRH which would stimulate your anterior pituitary to secrete TSH, which would then stimulate the thyroid gland itself to release T3 and T4, which we just mentioned um, regulates your BMR and your thermoregulation. We can have things go wrong. Okay, so there are a couple of thyroid disorders that are fairly common. First is myxedema. This is severe hypothyroidism in adults. People suffering from myxedema will experience hair loss, dry skin, they'll be tired, their brains will be kind of foggy and groggy, they'll be slower um, than normal as far as their thinking and their mental capacities go. Their um, heart rate slows down, they gain a bunch of weight. This picture shows um, a patient before and after treatment for her myxedema. So you can see that she had gained weight and just the look on her face, she just seems like she doesn't feel very well after treatment. She's lost some of that weight um, <clears throat> and she just looks like she feels a little bit better as well. Now cretinism is severe hypothyroidism um, from birth. So immediately something is wrong. Um, <clears throat> these patients will suffer from underdeveloped bodies, weak bones and muscles, their skin will be very thick, and they will also have impaired mental developments. So as long as we can diagnose this, then we can treat this as well. Um, but this tends to still be an issue in some third world countries. Additional thyroid disorders include goiters and Graves' disease. If you suffer from a goiter like this patient does, will have a large mass. We call this a goiter. Um, this will be an enlarged thyroid gland in the neck. If you suffer from goiter, you either lack sufficient amounts of iodine in your body or you have the inability to metabolize that iodine properly. 
Um, the additional symptoms besides the goiter itself would be similar to the hypothyroidism that we just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. So now we have too much thyroid hormone. Patients suffer from sleep troubles, their heart rate has increased, they lose weight, their BMR goes up. Um, they end up with heat sensitivity. The higher BMR means, oops, go back. The higher BMR means that they are putting out more heat through metabolic processes anyway, and so they tend to overheat a little quicker than normal. Um, increased sweating, brittle hair, hand tremors, and then this weird science word, exophthalmos. So if you have, like in this lady, ever seen somebody whose eyes just look like they're about to pop out of somebody's head, that's exophthalmos. So the eyeballs tend to protrude more than normal. All right, our other hormone from our thyroid gland is the calcitonin, specifically coming from those parafollicular cells. When your blood calcium levels go above normal, so they're a little too high, calcitonin is released. We're trying to get those uh, blood calcium levels back down to normal. In order to do that, the calcitonin activates osteoblasts. Osteoblasts, their job is to take calcium from the blood and deposit it into the bones. So you're going to build bone. Once you have removed the calcium from the blood, obviously the blood calcium levels go back to normal and we would um, close that feedback loop. And if you remember back to the skeletal system, you also have another cell, osteoclasts. Their normal job is to break down bones, okay, which would increase blood calcium levels. Well, in this case, we don't want that to happen because the blood calcium levels are already high. And so another function of calcitonin would be to inhibit those osteoclast activities. So we're not trying to, you know, decrease our blood levels here, but then these cells are trying to increase it. We don't want that opposition. So we're going to inhibit those osteoclasts for the time being. All right. On the back side of the thyroid gland, you have your parathyroid glands. Um, these tend to um, not show up on anatomical models because they are on the back side of the thyroid gland itself. You have these four little islands of parathyroid cells. Um, they are composed of chief cells, which is the cell that actually secretes the parathyroid hormone itself. The target of the parathyroid hormone is the bones, and the example that we just talked about, the calcitonin, was inhibiting the osteoclasts. Well, the target of parathyroid hormone is the osteoclast because now we're going to stimulate them. So if your blood calcium levels get too low, one of the ways that we can increase that is to take osteoclasts, do a little bit of bone resorption, break down those bones a little bit. Some of that calcium that has been stored in the bones would be released and we can put it into the blood to help raise blood calcium levels. Now, we do have other ways of increasing blood calcium levels as well. So in addition, the parathyroid hormone doesn't just stimulate osteoclasts in the bones. It also stimulates your kidneys to promote more calcium reabsorption and to help convert inactive vitamin D into the active form, calcitriol, okay? um, which calcitriol is required for calcium reabsorption. And so it's important to have both of those substances. And last but not least, parathyroid hormone also targets your intestines. Again, we're trying to promote the absorption of calcium so we can increase those blood calcium levels. Okay. So calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are basically antagonists here. One helps us raise blood calcium levels. One helps us drop blood calcium levels back down to normal. We can also have parathyroid disorders. We can have hyperparathyroidism. Obviously, we would have too much parathyroid hormone in the blood. This would increase your blood calcium levels, but there is a cost to that. Um, if we are continuously releasing too much parathyroid hormone, we would be breaking down your bones a little too much. You would end up with osteoporosis, so you can see a normal bone versus an osteoporotic bone. 
Okay, we've taken too much of that calcium out. You could also end up with kidney stones. So having too much calcium, um, your body's going to do something with it. And one of the things that kidneys, some kidney stones are made of is calcium. And then chronic fatigue. Um, you know, having too much of something, it's just never really a good thing. There's always that limit. Now, hypoparathyroidism, not having enough PTH, obviously your calcium levels would be a little too low. This is a big problem as well because if we remember back to how action potentials work, calcium is involved. So we've got our neuromuscular junction here or our postsynaptic um, cleft example. You can see we've got voltage-gated calcium channels that are responsible for neurotransmitter release. So if we don't have enough calcium, we might not be able to release enough neurotransmitter to start our next action potential, be it on a nerve or a muscle fiber.